Okay, just as people are joining us, I will, let's just start and make the most of our time. So for those of you who've not met me before um, in person, or maybe even virtually, my name's Kirsty. Um, I'm the founder of the School of Facilitation. And one of the th reasons I started the School of Facilitation was to be able to connect up the different facilitators and trainers and even coaches who are out there because I couldn't um, see how to do that myself. So I just thought I'd create that space. And one of the things I've been thinking about that I want to do over time is bring to everybody different elements of learning. And as a friend of mine and I discussed on Friday, it's like, how do you bring the um, cherry on the top of the cake to your own development and growth as a facilitator or a trainer? Um, and often we're really good at diving deep into our own topics or areas of expertise and then we start to recognize there's lots of other things going on around us in our space like on conferences and virtual learning and visual graphics but it's not something we can put our whole hearted energy into so we're going to do little snap chats all through next year and this is going to be one of our first ones hence joe who's a bit of a virtual learning expert um so we're going to Joe's going to introduce herself in a moment, we'll see if anyone else is going to join us. And then what we're going to invite you guys to do is pose questions about virtual learning, um, because I think that's probably the best way. I've got some polls to see who's involved in virtual learning already, but um, we've got an hour and we're just going to talk, basically. So Joe and I have the chat. I'm going to invite you to keep putting in questions to the pot. Um, yeah, and we're going to play with it that way. I think it's the best thing. So, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity of working with you, Kirsty. We've been chatting about this on and off for a little while, and I'm really, really pleased uh, that we can make this happen. And hello to everybody who's joined us so far, everybody who uh, is watching the recording a little bit later on. My name is Joe Cook. I'm the founder and director of Lightbulb Moment. And like Kirsty, I kind of started it with a, a bit of a, a mission in mind, if you like, which was to help other people with their virtual learning, with their webinars, uh, because it's, you know, we've all got great facilitation or training or design skills, but actually virtual classrooms are a little bit different. So you can use all your skills, but we need to learn some new ones as well. And, and I will probably come up to this later on, but I kind of almost fell into this by accident, found that I loved it. And, and it's my mission to help people make really great virtual sessions. And so that's what I offer is virtual classroom, train the trainer, and all sorts of other kind of services, offerings, consultancy, and that kind of rubbish, really. Um, and that's what I'm here to chat about today. Cool. So we're going to start with a poll. And a poll, the question is this, and you'll see it come up uh, on your toolbar. So you can select whichever answer you want. And the question is, virtual classrooms are great, but not for me. A good idea, but won't replace face-to-face -face training have no role in learning, great for the future, but not now, awesome, count me in, I'm already using them. So select an answer, because we are just curious as to what your thoughts are about virtual learning. So is that poll launched, Kirsty? No, I've got to press a button. And that's <laughs> what we're learning here today, people, how to use technology. And for those of you who know me really well, you should be giggling right now that I am rubbish at this. Oh, I think you've done an amazing job because by your own admission, this is completely new to you. And so I think just the fact that you're doing it and offering it out there is a huge, huge step and you should absolutely be commended for that. I put my, God, my halo to one side. Okay, we, I think everyone's nearly answered. Give it a couple more. So 89% of you have voted. I think some of you are on the telephone, hence why you may not be able to vote. Interesting. Ooh. Ooh, the votes are still coming in. 95% of you have voted. This is cool. I feel like I could be on... Eurovision at this point. <laughs> Nil <point. laughs> Okay, I think this is as much as we're going to get. 95% of you have voted. So I'm going to close it out, all this technology. So interestingly, 6% of you, six of you have said great for the future, but not for now. 
44% have said a good idea, but it won't replace face-to-face -face facilitation. 50% uh, said awesome, count me in, already using it. And Ben in the end said, it's cool, but not yet using it. I needed another option. I only had five options to write in the poll, Ben, but thank you for that. <laughs> intro. So isn't that really interesting? It's like 50% of us saying, yeah, let's get involved and I'm already using it. And then some of us are still thinking, actually, it's a good idea, but it's not going to replace face to face. And that's definitely where I started my my thinking in that it it is a good idea, but it won't replace. I'm now coming more to the space of it's a good idea, and I think it can come alongside, especially when you're in embedding phases working with corporates. Um, we can talk about that more as we go through. Um, I've got another poll, and I thought I'd we'd ask this as well. So it says, who's attended the following? So what you can do is you can select as many options as you need to here. So who's attended the following? E-learning, a live virtual classroom, um, a live webinar, a recorded virtual classroom, or a recorded webinar? And the results are coming in, thick and fast. Again, some interesting responses coming through too. Yeah. 89% uh, of you. Okay, so Sarah is asking, what's the difference between a webinar and a virtual classroom? Joe, do you oh, want to ask that question? Please? Good question, good question. Let's, uh, whilst we've got the poll open and we're thinking about this question, why don't some of you write in that question panel, write your own answers? Now, I know it says it's a question panel, but we're going to use it a bit like a chat panel today. So, so for you guys, what is the difference between a webinar and a virtual classroom? I certainly think there's a difference, and, and that's why we've put those in the poll. But what do you think the differences are? And if you're not sure, fair enough, you don't have to put anything or you can say not sure. If you've got an idea of how you think they're different, just write it in that question panel and hit enter and it will come up on our screen. I know that you guys can't at all see it, but we will read those out. So let us know what you think those differences are. For me, it's largely around kind of two main factors the biggest one is actually how many people are involved uh, Claire says uh, that a webinar is more one way it's a presentation a virtual classroom is like what we're doing now all oh, interesting uh, that you say that Claire and Des says a webinar is a broad audience group live feedback and responsive to audience needs Lee says a webinar is tell with interaction a virtual classroom has learners that do a lot of the discovery and Ben says a webinar has predefined content with limited interaction really great responses and often the webinars that we've been on have been have been very much tell or lecture on one way the platforms don't always allow a lot of interaction so so that can be a little bit of a challenge a virtual classroom uh, you're absolutely right about that it's the same as you would do face to face you just happen to be doing it on a platform a little bit like we are today so that can involve all of the great things that you do about virtual this or, or Sorry, all of the great things you do about face-to-face -face facilitation, facilitation. See, I told you I needed the coffee, Kirsty. Uh, but doing it online. Um, and Lee is saying, love the fact that you allowed us to answer. And that is the whole point, Lee, rather than just telling you. Uh, so yeah, it's all of those things. Plus, I would say a webinar can be for lots of people. Now, whether lots of people is 20 or 200 or 2,000, that's entirely up to you. But a virtual classroom, just like a face-to-face -face classroom, should be less people, in my opinion. And then Elia said, um, I'm not too sure, but I hope there is a different technical tool which makes it possible to get more interactive for virtual learning. And we'll talk more about that, um, Elia, as we go through. Let me give you the um, result of the polls. So 100% of people who answered, by the way, 89% voted. 100% have gone through e-learning. 35% have experienced virtu a virtual classroom live. 100% of us have been on a live webinar. 24% have experienced a recorded virtual classroom and 88% have experienced a recorded webinar. So it feels like people are starting to, we're getting used to using um, laptops and that, that kind of learning form. That's becoming more maybe common than it was when we all first started 10, 15, 20 years ago. The piece that's not 
yet as embedded or used potentially in these virtual classrooms or that virtual learning tool. Um, yeah. Now, my next question is, okay, final poll for the moment, and I'm going to launch this. Who has delivered the following? A live virtual classroom. Who has delivered and therefore put out a recorded virtual classroom? Oh no, we've got um, we've got a one answer only on this. It should be multiple choice. Oh, bugger! <laughs> so what we did is we designed this poll on purpose to show you how not to do it, didn't you, Kirsty? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I quite a high giving preference with little attention to detail. <laughs> Um, so, so let's maybe think about this in a different way. Um, have you done more of webinars or virtual classrooms, something like that? Um, and, uh, and of course, you've got that question box that you can use to type in. And Des has done that and says, none of these, all face to face today. Brilliant, Des, you would absolutely not be the only person here. Um, Sarah Urquhart, we'll hold your question for the moment, but we'll come back to it. So optimum numbers for a virtual classroom. Let's just, I'll hold that and come back to it. 63% um, have voted. It's like the tension. If you, if you want to get your vote in, the time is now. That's interesting. Lee's made a comment of, oh, there's lots of scope to improve. Thanks, Lee. Um, <laughs> small rooms are an issue with a live virtual classroom. Okay, the poll, I'm going to close it in 10 seconds. So if you want to get your thoughts in. And Peter says, I did recently a refresher of training by virtual classroom, connecting to five offices. That's brilliant, Peter. So, you know, as we go through, do share you know, what was successful, what was maybe challenging out of that. That would be good to know. Um, so here are the poll results. 15% um, of us have delivered on a recorded webinar. 31% uh, have delivered a live virtual classroom and 54% have then delivered a live webinar. So it's good. So people are having experience with this. It's whether you're like me and it's um, trial by error. I just wanted to read out a couple of comments though. So Jess over in Ireland, I've been working with three different groups in rural Ireland using a virtual classroom. We have face-to-face -face sessions twice a module though, which are an absolute necessity. I get that to create that connectivity. Um, Claire Holt, um, I work in L&D and we have a greater interest this year in people getting training on how to give good webinar meetings and training. Totally agree. People know if it's boring, their attendees will be checking their mails, doing something else on the side. So we have a current need to, to engage people in their learning and then be more fluent with this skill. Um, ah, Lee, yes, I haven't worked out how to do this. It'd be really useful to see the poll results visually not so Kirsty next to the poll that's closed there's a share okay. button there you go thank you for that Lee great question so, so there's the answers on that so, do that. The screen. so Joe do you want to describe for people in your own words what does virtual learning mean to you to me it's about having an absolutely awesome session around whatever your topic is, getting energy from your participants, um, giving energy back to your participants, having great discussions, great discovery, um, and all of the things that you can do face to face, I would say 99% of that you can do online. Uh, and I honestly believe that, I've honestly experienced that. And, and it's about then you've got another absolutely amazing modality that you can use when it's appropriate. Sometimes face-to-face -face will be appropriate and absolutely carry on with that. 
and other times a virtual classroom or a webinar will be the right thing too. So a webinar could be with a lot more people and Sarah, you asked um, what were the optimum numbers for a virtual classroom. I'd say you could have two or four or six people, probably optimum is around six or eight, maximum 10. So when I run my virtual train the trainer programs, we max out at 10. Any more than 10 and you're starting to get more into a webinar style environment where you can't have the individual communication and relationship building and rapport and understanding of each other. And so when you talk about webinars, Joe, how would you describe a webinar then? So a webinar can still have really great interaction. It can still be a great learning tool. It can still involve conversation and learning and all of these great things, but you're doing it like a seminar. So you could have 50 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, um, and therefore that's a very different thing from when you're actually having six or eight or 10 of you in a classroom. So you imagine the difference between attending a seminar or conference and going to a 10-person roundtable discussion, and that's your difference between webinar and virtual classroom. Brilliant. And then what's e-learning? E-learning, oh, it's such a difficult topic to, to describe because it means different things to different people. Traditionally, most people use that to mean a module of learning which is designed, it's self-paced, it's click next, you probably access it through your learning management system and typically we've experienced those for compliance, diversity, that kind of thing, especially in the larger corporate organisations. Um, E-learning can be an absolutely great tool, it can be really, really useful and the terminology is often used really broadly but then you get kind of mixed up and say, well, if we want e-learning, is that a module of self-paced click next or is that a webinar or is it curated? Is it social media? So things like the digital learning offering, they're kind of better terminology for that broad overall, in my opinion. OK, um, we've just got some comments coming in and I still want to read them out. One, uh, thanks, Sarah Urquhart. I didn't realise that the poll stays up. You can't see me. So therefore, I'm still learning. Um, Des. Um, a background thought, having not set up a webinar myself, it feels like a big technical step into the unknown. I've attended plenty and they never seem to run smoothly, so is a classroom environment more easily controllable? Um, Des, I think my answer is, when I first started even running the workshop and classroom environment and someone like Ben Lewis who was there with me on that journey, knows that I felt that that was uncontrollable because it was so new to me doing the face-to-face. Whereas now, having done it for 10 years, I'm really comfortable in that face-to-face -face environment. My question might be to the rest of us is, because it's technology and it's something we're not used to yet, is that why it suddenly feels um, a little bit shaky or it doesn't go as smoothly? And sometimes it feels really obvious because it's, it's there in our faces. Whereas when we run face-to-face, -face, half of that's not going smoothly either. And we're just doing that swan-like impression and just covering our tracks. That's yeah. one thought. Um, and I think you've got a great point about that, Kirsty, because there is that, that's one of the big challenges with going into delivering webinars or virtual classrooms is there is a layer of technology and skill that you've got to learn. Um, and, and I'm not going to shy away from that because it's there and it's real. And especially if you're not so digitally minded, if you're not so computer literate, it can feel like an uphill struggle. So there's a couple of things to think about here. One is quite frankly, tough luck, we've got to get on with it, that's the way our industry and our profession and our life and our world is going, so get on board rather than being left behind. But kind of looking at that in a bit more detail, it's about learning one step at a time. So Kirsty, you're highlighting that you're doing that today and you're doing a really great job of learning one step at a time. We talked about before we came on the session about doing something different with the software and I said, Kirsty, one step at a time. Uh, let's get the basics right and then we can experiment with some other stuff. And, and then the other thing is about working together with other people. So there are companies out there that do services where they offer you a producer or a host. So that would be the somebody looking after all of the technical stuff whilst you then focus on your delivery. Or it could be within your organization, you have somebody who's more technically comfortable and maybe less of a subject matter expert and you can work with them. So there's lots of different ways you can look at building up those skills, but definitely there are challenges with the technology, but it's about learning around that and overcoming it. And like Kirsty said, being the swan gliding on top of the water. 
Um, <laughs> another question we had from Kirsten Holder, and Kirsten, as I know, is up in the Midlands way. And Kirsten asked, um, which tool would you recommend for webinars? And I think this is a general question as well, because there are multiple tools out there. So let's talk so about many. Yeah, and, and actually people email me every, every week saying, oh, what do you think of this tool? And I'm thinking, I've never heard of it. Uh, so there are so, so many tools out there. Um, I'm not going to necessarily recommend a specific tool for you, because actually what you need to do is think about a variety of things. So a few things to think about. One, for your attendees, the environment you're looking at, especially if you're inside an organization, what restrictions do you have around security, firewalls, VPN connections, um, and what's the other thing I'm thinking? Oh yes, admin rights on your computers to be able to download a piece of software. So that's a big choice as to, do I want people to be able to download something and do they have the admin rights on their computer to install that? Or do I need them to attend in the cloud? Do we have the security settings open for that? So solicitors, banking, insurance, any of that area, that's a really big thing to have a look at. Another thing to have a look at, going back to that previous question, is what's the, what's the model that you are going to be using for delivery? If it is going to be you and you are going to be the absolute virtual classroom webinar expert in your company, you're going to do it probably for 80% of your job, then you can learn the software, learn all the skills, go and do it all on your own and you can be the expert and therefore you might choose one piece of software over another. So a really good example of this is the Cisco WebEx system, uh, WebEx Training Center. It's one of my favorites. I've used it for years and it's got some really nice features when you're delivering on your own, especially if you're doing any kind of screen sharing. Maybe you're teaching Excel, maybe you're teaching processes, um, something like that. So the other thing to think of with that model is are you working with a host, a producer, so basically are you co-facilitating with another trainer and or is somebody actually kind of doing the technical role for you. So if somebody's doing that, you need to look at software that allows that a little bit easier. So Adobe Connect is one of the other big ones that people have probably heard of. I love that because it's got a behind the scenes area. As a, a technical host, I can take control of everything and the facilitator doesn't need to worry about it. And there's loads of other software in between. Price is the other then point that you're looking at. Adobe Connect and WebEx, they are top notch and really expensive, and there's loads and loads of other options in the middle. So that's the so, short answer. So, Joe, I know looking at this list of lovely attendees, a lot of us are have our own businesses um, as facilitators and trainers and coaches, and many of us are starting to dip our toe into running sessions like this. And I just landed on GoToWebinar after a bit of a search, would I use it again? Maybe not, because there's some limitations in this connectivity piece. My question on behalf of the gang on this call is what other what other tools are there that we could be using? And some, Jess has just asked, and what are some of the price points? Because that would be really helpful to understand if you, if you happen to know some of the price points. Yes, okay, really good questions. So, um, so I'm running my own business as well. It's me and one other person. Admittedly, this is this is what I focus on. So it's a little bit different. So I have opted with Adobe Connect um, because I know it. It's really versatile. You can do loads of funky stuff with it. Uh, I've got a 100 user license because what I want to be able to do is offer public webinars, which are basically marketing my virtual classroom, train the trainer. So I wanted to be able to have up to 100 people on that. For a year, that's cost me around about £1,300, including the VAT. It could be cheaper if I had a 25-person license, which if I was only ever doing virtual training and not kind of marketing webinars, then I would probably have gone for that. I can't remember the price. Right. Uh, let's say five, six, seven hundred pounds, I can't remember. So on the other end of the scale, something like Zoom is a really good thing to have a look at. It's got loads of great features. Uh, it's got lots of the virtual classroom features and it's got some really good video stuff in there as well. And that's reasonably cheap. There are different versions of it. You can get a free version where you can have, I think, 45 minute sessions uh, of up to 25 people and monthly costs will be different. It could be 
25, 30 pound a month. And a lot of the software these days, some of the big things like Adobe Connect, you have to do the year up front. But things like WebEx, Zoom, uh, Webinar Jam, Webinar Ninja, they're both great for webinars rather than virtual classrooms. And they can be relatively cheap and on a monthly basis. So you could dip into one for a few months, decide it's not for you, and dip into another one for a, for a few months. Yeah. So that would be something to have a look at. Uh, Sarah asks, can you use Adobe Connect on your own, Joe? Yes, absolutely you can. You can do all of them on your own if you have the skills, experience, and confidence to do it. Yeah. So these days I have my business operations manager, Michael, he's now my producer on my sessions, simply because I have him and he needs to learn how to do that. Uh, he's on this session today. Um, but actually, prior to April of this year, 95, 98% of all of my webinars, public, private, all of my training, I've delivered on my own. Now, I've got a skill set where I'm doing this all day, every day. I'm not suggesting if you are just starting out that you should do that, but you can if that's what you want to focus on. So let's just go back over this. So some of the names, and I'll make sure we put them in the email. So we've got yes. Cisco WebEx. Yeah, Cisco WebEx, and within WebEx you've got a few different options, but WebEx Training Center is the one that you need um, to make sure that you're looking for if you want great okay. virtual classrooms. We've then got, um, I'm on the GoTo system, so GoTo offer GoTo Meeting, GoTo Webinar, and GoTo Learning, and the price just seems to go up, and there's just different functionality. So the thing I've uh, learned about that oh, is sorry, I'll check, check the functionality, because that's yes. the big so if I'm really honest with all of you on GoToWebinar, the thing I'm now really frustrated with is not being able to have that interaction for the whole group. Um, so you can have a one-way conversation with me and Joe. Uh, what we can't do is get you guys chatting in this space together, and we can't actually get you chatting um, in separate mm -hmm. classrooms, which some other technology allows you to do. Uh, we've also got Zoom. And I use that when there's small Let me groups. just interrupt a second. Go back to the GoTo. GoTo Meeting actually has the chat window. So it won't have some other features, but it does have the chat window. So that's something you could look at. Okay. Then we've got Zoom. So Cisco, Adobe, Zoom. I mean, Skype now as well, have Skype for Business. And then also I've seen uh, the Gmail tool used as well in some instances. People have used, there's a, um, a video in Circles. Something yeah. Like yeah, so there's different tools. It's And it comes down to what have you got already? So there are tools that I like, there are tools that I don't like, even the tools that I love, there are bits where I want to pull my hair out uh, yeah. and I wish they were better. But it's always about go with what you've got and make the best use of that. So Skype for Business, quite frankly, it's not great. It doesn't have the functionality that you want for a really great virtual okay. classroom. But if it's all you've got, then go with it. Like with what we've got today, we don't have a chat window, but we're getting you guys to write stuff in. We're seeing it all. Even if we don't read it out, we're definitely seeing it all and trying to cover everything. Um, and Joe, I really like what you said around potentially finding the subscriptions that allow you to dip in and out so you can have a test and a play. I think that's really important. Um, okay, I'm going to move on from technology. Um, got a question here from Sarah. Oh, that's interesting. So, two questions from Sarah um, about designing for the virtual mm. classroom. Actually, no, I want to go back. Elia said, is there technology where you can create um, virtual spaces for groups to go off and have conversations on their own? Yes, so breakout rooms. So what I'm imagining you're, you're thinking of is like you would do face to face. You'd say, OK, we've got three groups. Here's a flip chart and pens. You go off to the meeting room. You go off to the boardroom. You go off to the canteen. Go and talk about whatever. Come back in 15 minutes and we'll do a plenary and we'll, we'll debrief. And you can absolutely do that on on. Uh, virtual classroom software. So this is why it's really important, like you say, Kirsty, to find the right features. So WebEx uh, Meeting Center versus Training Center, one has the breakouts, Training Center, Meeting Center doesn't. Uh, okay. Go to Webinar, which we're in today, doesn't have it. Go to Training, I think does have it. I haven't used it in ages, I must admit. So it's about finding that software. And the really great, cool thing you can do is you can set stuff up, depending on the software, you can set stuff up beforehand. So you could have 
slides and whiteboards and whiteboards are just a flip chart basically yeah. you can put slides in there which people can write on so suddenly your slide deck becomes interactive yeah. um, you could put all sorts of instructions you could put media files in somewhere you can dip in and out of the breakout rooms just like you would go and pop your head through the door uh, normally and also what you can do is you can get people to screen share or application share so let's say you're teaching Excel or you're teaching a process or you want them to write a script or whatever imagination you can come up with somebody can be in there sharing their screen of whatever software and, and they can be working on something simultaneously and there's loads of other great ways that you could use it as well so hopefully that's answered your question um, so I'd like to jump to the question around designing for a virtual classroom so again I'm guessing many of us are really comfortable to sit down and design virtual sessions a lot of us are really comfortable coaching either face to face or through the telephone so what's the same and what's different about great designing question great question and not many people ask that question so that's really really important so a couple of things here so Mike who's my business operations manager he's on today uh, what he's going to do he's going to tweet on your Twitter handle so that Kirsten we're doing the hashtag SOF gathering he will tweet out a link to my facilitation guide on my blog I will also email that to you um, afterwards as well so if you're following hash SOF gathering he's going to go and tweet that now for you um, with regards to design, I'd say two things before you even worry about virtual classroom, anything technical, anything software. One, it absolutely has to be based on the business need and the performance action that people need to take. So I'm absolutely certain you're all doing this already. Performance consulting, Kathy Moore's action mapping, something along those lines, rather than being the order taker and saying, yes, how many sessions would you like? Mm -hmm. Assuming that you've done that, put that to one side. The other thing then is actually just design as you would do normally. So I would say, you know, once you know what the performance need is, what the gap is, and all of those things, then you will be able to think, right, well, what actions do people need to perform? Therefore, what activities do we need to design into a session? And it could be role play, it could be word searches, it could be discussion, it could be any one of a million different things. And, and then, you know, you, later on you come to kind of what bits of knowledge and, and how am I going to facilitate that. All of that is pretty much the same. It doesn't matter whether you're doing face to face or whether you're doing virtual. It's only when you get to the next step where you have to then think about the logistics of, right, well, I need to have an activity where they practice or do or make or whatever. And what you might do face to face is everybody gathers around a table with a flip chart and makes a poster on a topic. And obviously you can't do that in a virtual classroom. So how can you adapt that or do an online version? Well, we could put people into breakouts with a whiteboard and get them to use the annotation tools. Um, you know, how can you get everybody to contribute? Normally you would go around the room and talk to people. Well, if we're using telephones and microphones, which you would do in a virtual classroom, we're not today on a webinar then you go around and you ask people you say okay Bob let's unmute you and hear your answer to whatever it might be you can use your whiteboard tools your slide you can design kind of rows for people we call them swim lanes to go and type their answer in so you ask your open question people go and type their answer and then you actually kind of go okay well Bob just expand on that a bit more or somebody might ask in the chat window what does Alice think of this so that's the only part at which you then start thinking how do I design that differently the key thing the absolute key thing to designing online is actually not necessarily directly to do with the technology but it is to do with keeping people engaged normally face to face we have the trainer and each other to look at activities to do so on and so forth online it's our slides usually we don't always have webcam on the whole time like we are today um, and what we need to make sure that we do is we have an interactive element designed every two to three minutes ideally every three to five minutes um, is what the books will say and what that could be is using all of the different technology and that's when the design point comes in because you have to kind of answer ask your questions differently really great example is you might ask an, a closed question first so most virtual classroom software will give you a green tick red cross yes no answer so have you got experience of topic x have you ever had a time where x happened 
green tick, red cross. And you might have an anomaly of two or three people answering opposite to everyone else. And then you're the, they're the people you say, well, let's open up the microphone. You tell us a bit more. If you all put a green tick just in the chat room, type a couple of words of what your experience was or so on. It's about then building up those bits of technology together. And um, just as you were talking, one of the things I was thinking about is how long can a virtual classroom last? And is there an ideal length of time? So it, again, it depends on your audience. So the e-learning guild in America did some research quite a few years ago now, and they found that something like 92% of their people who responded to their survey were doing things around 60 to 90 minutes, maybe 120 minutes, up to a couple of hours. And you might be thinking, oh, a couple of hours online sitting at a computer. No. But when you do it well, that time just flies past. It really does. You have a break in the middle because, quite frankly, after an hour, we probably all need to go to the loo um, and grab another cup of coffee or whatever it is that you're drinking. So you can do that. Uh, you, I've been on all day sessions and that works. Yeah. But you need really great breaks. You need really great sessions and you need really great activities. So you might have an activity of half an hour where it's you at your computer and doing things. Um, and, and that's a little bit different from being in a session a bit like this. Okay. The other thing with knowing your audience is um, I've found that um, I was talking to somebody at a conference and they were doing 15 minute webinars. But this was in a professional services area where, where quite literally time is money. They, they have to have uh, bookable hours and payable hours, so solicitors and so on. And 15 minutes is working perfect for them. Um, but then I've worked in the automotive industry and they found that anything less than two hours for an online session, their attendees thought it wasn't worth turning up, so they didn't bother. But two hour sessions, the feedback was, yep, that's worth me carving the time out and coming and sitting down. Um, a question from Claire Holt is, what about Crowdcast? Mm, Crowdcast is really good. So Crowdcast is it's a little bit like what we're doing today, or a little bit like the training journal webinars, if you've ever been on those, where you have one or two people on screen, or four people on screen, um, having a chat. You've got a chat room. It doesn't have things like breakout rooms and stuff like that. It's not a virtual classroom tool. It is a, a seminar kind of tool. Um, but it does have a question area. Uh, you can do a screen share if you want to. So every day at 4 p.m., there, 4 p.m. UK time, there is a Crowdcast um, discussion called TLDC, so that's Training, Learning and Development uh, Chat, TLDC, um, and you can go in and have a look at that. I've been, on, I've been on one before, I've hosted one, and I've been on one, so again, I know Mike's in the chat room and he's there, so he's going to go and find it on our resources page. Um, and send a little couple of links to that so you can just go and have a look at recording if, if only for five minutes just to get a visual sense of yeah. what that is but that's a really great tool too I've had a play with that really liked it nice um, what am I reading do you know of any tools where you can have the participants work in groups I guess that's the question Claire that's super cool thank you I've done it for big courses and it was a good one Ah, fantastic. Well done, Claire. Um, what are, I'm thinking, so when I'm starting to design solutions for my clients, mm. uh, old, old World would have it, like you'd have a, an intervention of a workshop, um, and I'm always about how do you then embed, often it's like around new skills, new behaviours, and I know that a workshop isn't enough for that one-off session, so part of me is now thinking how do you bring the virtual learning or webinars into that embedding process um, post a, a workshop um, what how have you seen virtual learning used effectively Joe? all sorts of ways um, and, and I think what's really great with virtual classrooms is that whilst you can do all day if you want to I wouldn't recommend it most of the time. Yeah. So anywhere between an hour and two hours is absolutely great, depending on your audience, as I said before. Um, and what that usually means is if you would normally do a day or two days, what that usually means is you're, you're chunking that up and then you're distributing that over a, an appropriate period of time. It could be every morning for a week. It could be over two or three or four weeks. And by its very nature, 
that is then going to be spaced out so people have time to digest and do something in between mm -hmm. and therefore you can set homework you can have resources that people go and have a look at you can have a social community somehow and that doesn't have to be any kind of big scary thing it could just be let's have a chat on email it could be let's direct message each other in, in yammer or, or whatever it is it could be that we've got a group there it could be you set something up like a free slack group so there's all sorts of different things you can do that way um, i think in terms of what we can also do it's a quick and easy way to come together so it doesn't have to be about you training something and delivering something you could use it like an action learning set which is all about making sure that you are, are giving space for people to come together to talk and for you to facilitate that uh, so i'm looking at launching next year i'm going to be doing some mentoring webinars so it's a subscription model where we come together for 90 minutes a month and focus on and practice our virtual classroom or webinar skills and build up our experience so in that 90 minutes i'm probably going to have maybe 20 minutes of material that i deliver but then there's going to be lots of discussion lots of experiment it's going to be the kind of place where you guys would go mm, i've got this activity i'm not very sure about how it's going to work can i just try that for five minutes yeah. um, or i had this issue the other day how would you guys have handled it and so on and so forth and that's what you can do for your attendees as well and, and making it also part of the blend so that you could do for instance a, a broad webinar with some information delivery really well but information delivery nonetheless you could have a face-to-face -face meeting of a day or two days whatever's appropriate and then you could have six months of one a month one a week of a couple of hours virtual classroom and really build those skills and that report so it's about just finding the right bits to put together and that will create the group and the behavior change and allow people to share um, and to build on, on what it is that they need to change in their skills and behavior and if I think about some of the clients who are actually even on this call guys and think about how we often run two-day workshops and then we want to get the line managers involved in the embedding process we want to check in with the delegates who've been through the workshop with us bringing them back in into a virtual classroom scenario or those action learning sets is a really great way to check in on what skills have they been learning what questions do they have what challenges are they facing and and solving those together, but doing it in a really cost-effective way. We haven't talked about pricing even, but being cost-effective in that you don't have to take people off the road or get people out of their office space to go into a physical classroom. You can actually just do this from their desk um, and keep it quite short and sharp. And therefore, it's a uh, clients will like that because it's a uh, saving on the cost. Yeah, and I think that uh, really. You know, we haven't mentioned it previously, but we can't overlook it. I'm flying to Amsterdam next week, basically for a one day conference. And with flights, hotel and food, I'm looking at about 500 quid. Now, that's OK. I've made that decision. I'm going to get something out of it. But if we had to do that for every one of our attendees of 10, 20, 30 people, that's a horrific amount of money. Mm. And also you've got your carbon emissions and all of that kind of other stuff as well. So this allows to have that frequent interaction and you can do all sorts of different things depending on your groups. So yeah. I've worked in the past where there was a coaching uh, program going on and so some of the sessions we matched up we had the coachy and the coacher and we made sure they were on the sessions together because the, the design was let's talk about that relationship other sessions were just for the coaches other sessions were just for the coaches because they were different so you can mix yeah. and match all those things together um, so a couple of questions that are coming in so from Lee in Manchester how does recorded virtual classrooms work effectively Mm, really great question. Um, a lot of the people that I work with will say uh, we don't want to record the virtual classroom or it could be a webinar because we want to encourage people to come along live. It's like, yep, yeah, totally get that. Really can see where that's coming from. But what about the people who miss out? But the nice thing with the virtual classroom that's recorded is people can still feel the interaction they can still feel that warmth and that rapport of the live session if you compare this to the other end of the extreme I haven't been able to make it to a face-to-face -face session and quite often what we get is here's a print out of the PowerPoint let me know if you've got any questions or five minutes of yeah we covered this this and this this is the key thing to take away 
It's like, really? You've just done the whole day in five minutes and slapped some printouts at me. Whereas with the virtual classroom, which we've recorded, you get basically a video of that whole session. And okay, you don't get to answer the poll, you don't get to write on the whiteboard, but you can still think about it. There's still that time between me asking question X, please write on the whiteboard, the pause whilst people think, the pause whilst people type, there's probably 30, 40 seconds, whatever, it's, whatever it is, you can still be thinking in that time. And actually when I have virtual classrooms and cohorts that I'm running and I know there are people not there, quite often I said, okay guys, let's answer question X on the whiteboard. And Bob, I know you're gonna watch this on the recording. You have to think about this too. Mm. What would you type if you were here? So actually they work really, really well. Yeah. I think also uh, when we're facilitating these live sessions, as facilitators, we just need to be cognizant that people will be watching this back as a recording, and therefore we need to really consider our language, how we're talking. Um, you said it at the start of this session, and for those of you who are listening to this in uh, the recording, well, oh, yeah. there's things like that. It's just things that we would do in Nakely face to face. We need to just shift and think about what what do we need to say, thinking about those who are not with us right now. Um, Claire Holt's question is, what is your experience with having someone manage the chat room? Mm, really interesting. So it depends largely on how big your session is and how busy it is. So if you're doing a virtual classroom session, much like you would do a face-to-face -face session with six, eight, ten people, I don't think you probably need that. You might need it at the beginning when you're just starting out and you're unsure and it's a challenge and you haven't built up the skills and experience yet. In which case, it's a great idea to co-facilitate or to be the producer or host for someone else to yeah. support each other and develop your own skills. Once you're at a point where you're kind of relatively stable with those skills, for a virtual classroom, I don't think you need it because you're going to be interacting so much with people and you're not going to be talking at or lecturing them, I hope. Um, so you shouldn't need that because much like a face-to-face -face session, you wouldn't talk at them for 20 minutes yeah. whilst you can see them going, ah, I've got a question. So it's just translating or deconstructing that experience yeah. into how you do that online. Cool. Um, if you've got a webinar though with lots of people, that's where your host or your producer or someone is really good at that and then if you're looking at marketing webinars again with lots of people you might actually want a whole team of people okay. so you might want your host your producer someone managing the chat room and that could be your sales people for instance so it depends on what you do who knew um i would just like to say from my personal experience um someone who's on here now in our sarah urquhart she stepped in as like a host for me the first time i ever did a webinar on my own so the thing it gave me was like i had a buddy virtually um, and she was just firing and managing the questions for me. So whilst my little brain can cope with talking and looking at chat boxes and pressing buttons, it worked really well to have someone else there. So yeah. one of my learnings as a newbie to this is get a friend involved. They don't know, uh, Sarah's had experience with this, so she knew what was gonna happen. So I, yeah, find a friend. Um, yeah. Question from said person, Sarah. Um, when you are running, virtual classrooms, is it, do you get participants to speak or do you just get them to write in the chat, in the chat boxes? Speak, 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 speak. So a virtual classroom should be as similar to a face-to-face -face classroom as you can make it. Therefore, that should be speaking. So whether that's VoIP, voice over IP, connecting through the computer like I am today with my headset, or through a telephone line, they absolutely should be speaking. Yeah. Um, they will write as well, and that's one of the cool things about the virtual classroom, is that if you've got a chat panel, they can type a comment to someone else, or to me, or ask a question anytime without interrupting the flow of things, just like you guys are today when you're asking questions. Um, by having the whiteboard, which is just like having a flip chart, except you know having a flip chart with even six or eight people around it gets a little bit kind of like, <laughs> a bit difficult. But on a virtual session, you can have them all using the whiteboard at the same time. Mm -hmm. And because you can do these things at a similar time, it means you actually get to share more and learn more from each other because with eight people if you do a round robin asking them the question even if you think they'll only answer for a minute verbally 
there's always somebody, probably me, who's going to answer for two or three minutes yeah. and throws all your timing out. Whereas if they do it on a whiteboard or in the chat room, and then you pick maybe one or two people to expand on that, it's a much better use of that time. Yeah. It's only usually in a webinar where often you have more people where you wouldn't normally have everybody speaking. Okay. Only because there's more people. So as we drift towards the hour, we've got five minutes left, um, I'm going to ask you guys, um, having dipped your toe in, and some of you have done this before, or some of people are starting to think about it, I'm curious, where, when do you think you could use a webinar or a virtual classroom experience, either for your internal customers or for your clients? So right in the question box, where in the future, and you might have some live examples, can you use this kind of technology? So we've got follow-up and embedding learning um, for supervisions and check-ins. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Elia, uh, for a refresh session, so when you're working with the sales guys globally. Lindsay, I'm already using it for embedding learning between our face-to-face -face modules. Great. Uh, Sarah Street, for follow-up training on new products, following face-to-face. Ah, -face. Oh, Claire Hayes, I'm going to use it to refresh my MBTI. Mentoring um, for briefings, Peter, definitely. Um, Bettina, training for the sales reps. Oh, it's coming in really fast. Um, for my remote teams, this is definitely something where I work with capability managers and L&D managers, and they've got like a global remit or a European remit or large geographical location this is the way to go to get people engaged especially embedding and setting up uh lj says you can also use it to design workshops question mark and um, lynn's can you just write the question again because i don't understand it ben lewis um embedding and allow input to be prompted so yeah definitely getting people involved and getting um their input and understanding uh, Claire Holt, getting the theory parts out of the way and saving the in, saving the time for interaction, where we need that live energy in the face to face. And um, Philippa South, hey Philippa, embedding, refreshing uh, knowledge, and um, sharing success stories. That's a really great idea. And discussing the challenges the groups are having. Sarah, when the budget is tight. Um, Lee, oh I like this, bringing in subject matter experts so they can share their knowledge for others. Um, Joe. Oh, the Lin Lin yeah, as I say, Lindsay's re clarified that yes, you can use the virtual classroom or webinar or online meeting, is what I would probably call that then, in the design phase for programs uh, to do a design without gathering people from across the globe in a physical location. It helps reduce yeah. the cost of the design, absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, so I guess my question to you all now is, um, and just do a raise of hands, how many of you think that in 2018 you will have a go at using a virtual classroom or a virtual technology in your solutions? Hands going up. Claire Haynes, Claire Holt, Elia, Kirsten, Lee, Liz, LJ, Mike, Philippa, Peter, Rebecca, the two Sarahs. So there's more of us now. Yay! Dave, DB. <laughs> Des, not a hand, but it's a, it's a possible. It's an option. Well done, Des. Well done, Des. I think it's a good idea. So I would just be, I think for all of us, it's probably going to be the thing that's gonna I think it's a really good bolt on as well for our clients um, and to be putting it in and we now know that if you really want learning transfer to occur it's not enough just to do a, a one-stop shop or a one-time interaction you all know that intuitively and this is I think a really great way to start to get your clients involved and show them you can get the embedding piece going and for those of you who are internal l and d um, experts, this is another way that you can get your managers and leaders involved to embed the learning as well. Uh, uh, final... Sarah's question, if that's what cool. you're looking at. 
Uh, yes, it is. So, a couple of things. I'm going to try and share screens so that people can see. Can you can you guys see these slides? Joe, yeah, that's been up the whole time. Yep. Okay. So, so this is another top tip: is to have a second computer logged in as an attendee. Yeah, to do that. So, <laughs> how to find Joe? So, if you're a Twitter fan, these are her handles. Um, she also has an active Facebook group and also her website is absolutely jam-packed with resources, videos and blogs and also on LinkedIn. So each of us has our own preferred social media tool. Um, jo spans them all. Um, I'd really encourage you to go and find her Thank on you. one of those. Or spans them all, whichever one you want to see. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll put a uh, cool stuff Joe does. So Joe is part of the training journal family and every month she hosts a, um, a webinar and as you can see there's one um, next week at 10 a.m. on how we use social media to support learning. So I was on one earlier of can you really facilitate in a virtual world. Um, so here's some other tools. She was awesome by the way. Thank you. I will, this is going to be in the follow-up email, um, all these links and information so you can actually download it. And thanks to everybody. Bye. Bye.